it's been a minute. So, unfortunately, I feel like the majority of what I said in this video is just kind of obsolete at this point because, as I've said previously, this year I've realized that my mental health issues are actually a lot more serious than I once thought. So I've had to put in head-on effort to actually legitimately recover. And so I haven't been living my day-to-day -day life in the same way. And honestly, on top of that, I just have no idea what I want my life to look like in the future or what I want like this channel to look like. Um, so I don't want to like give you my plan because I feel like in a month that might need a change or something like that. Um, but I did figure that I could knock out this Q&A since that's pretty straightforward. And I do have two big projects coming. Um, they should be out within the next few months. So definitely keep an eye out for those. But in terms of like what my goals are, I don't fucking know. I just want to be creating. I do assume that this video is going to end up pretty long, so prepare yourself for that. Um, feel free to just skip around if you don't want to watch the whole thing because that's perfectly understandable. Um, first one, what are your thoughts on Tim Hecker? Uh, I think he's terrible. One of the worst ambient musicians of our time, for sure. Next question is, where can you meet girls who listen to Aphex Twin? I hate how many upvotes this comment has. This is like what people watch my channel for. Um, I assume you're asking, where do I find a girl who listens to Aphex Twin in real life? Because, I mean, on the internet, you could just join Deep Cuts Discord or go on Mew if you really want to go there. Um, but, you know, you're not just gonna, like, walk down the street and meet a girl who wants to enthuse about RDJ album with you, I understand. Um, I feel like if I, like, actually knew the answer to this question, I would have so many more friends. Um, but I think the problem is we're all just hiding in our room all the time. So, I don't really know what to tell you, but... Um, good luck in finding a girlfriend who listens to Aphex Twin, because that's apparently the most important quality a partner can have. Um, I randomly stumbled upon your channel today and watched some of your videos. It's very impressive how you're able to put your passion, emotion into words and go into such depths about so many different albums. I love Anthony's reviews too, but you really bring a fresh, unique, authentic, and raw perspective for your viewers. I hope you're doing well mentally and keep making videos. Are you still making visual art and posting it somewhere? Um, thank you so much. This was so like long and detailed and nice of you. I'm really glad you think my videos come across as authentic and raw, um, cause they are really wordy, but I really like the idea of both of those things being true at the same time, so. Um, and then I am still making visual art, um, although I did just pick this back up, so I haven't finished anything, so I haven't posted anything anywhere, but when I do, I will, and um, I am hoping to make this more of a priority in the future, I think, um, but again, anything can happen at any time with me, I don't know, I have a lot of things I'm interested in, uh, but I guess we'll see. And then best album you initially hated but grew to love over time. I actually have a great example um, of an album that I hated on first listen and recently this year I decided was like a 10 out of 10 perfect album and that's Schlagenheim by Black Midi. Um, I remember my first listen of this record so vividly because it was with Buffalo Staple actually and um, at the time Black Midi just had like a couple singles out. They were like this really hyped up cool new band um, and so we both listened to it at the same time and we didn't talk to each other at all. So the whole listen, um, I was just hating every second of it, just like letting the thoughts of what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? Kind of pile up in my head, um, just kind of burning to talk about it. And I had absolutely no idea how it was coming across to him. And then at the end, I was like, what did you think of that? And he was like, I hated it. And I was like, me too. And then we ended up being the only two people among our group of friends who didn't like this album. Like everyone else liked or loved it. And um, 
Now I'm proud to say that I revoke most of the things that I thought about it, but it's really just because I see it all in a new light now. I mean, I feel like even just the track Western alone is testament to how great the songwriting on this record is because it packs in so many meaningful intricacies, but zooming out, just the whole concept it's based around is so individual too. And there's also this moment on the track reggae where the protagonist is noticing his lack of wealth by the difference in the way he dresses as opposed to other people and in writing this i felt like the band was asking that you truly ask yourself what it would take for you to feel like a dignified person who deserves respect from others and whether or not that actually involves money or ever will um because i don't think it does but empathy and acting selflessly and using your skills your intelligence your expression whatever for greater selfless purpose will always matter and i feel like tracks like 953 and ductor remind me of that and they make me want to take a good critical look at who i am as a person and understand my ego to get out of it and that's the thing that happens internally nowhere else you know if you're truly where you should be at and I feel like in every sense, this record comes across as completely self-justifying and unafraid to do what the fuck it wants without bending over backwards trying to convince you of its merits. Like, it is too all over the place, but um, the way that everything's laid out so haphazardly just kind of convinces me of that. Or it's just like it's all naturally kind of flowing out of them. Like, it makes me feel like how my mind would feel just racing without anything blocking it. And I feel like this would probably make both natural lunacy and beauty surface. Um, like, I don't know if it's just me, but I find this record to be so beautiful. Um, like, Jordy Greep's vocal deliveries are just so strangely beautiful to me. And I love the way the instrumentals can just fall down to these gut-wrenchingly sinister and pessimistic, more low-key guitar passages. Um, so that's probably part of it. But this thing is really volatile and can get very jagged and angular and atonal and it uses all of these weird ass time signatures and just strange vocal effects or filters there are some dance rhythms in there um there's just a lot of weird shit going on and i find that when my dissociation is at its thickest this is one of the only things that can truly like pull me out of it and I guess I just find there to be quite a lot of value in that at this point in my life. I don't want to sit here and talk about every single little thing I get out of this record just because we would truly be here forever but um, a lot of the reason why it's a 10 for me is just because it's so self-justifying and because it just reminds me of being unafraid of how weird you feel internally and using that as a means to help you get through life. Um, next question is, what's the most an album has grown on you and the most an album has grown off? So Schlagenheim is a great example for on, but off is a little bit harder, honestly. Um, just because I find that when I develop a really strong bond with an album, um, it's very difficult for me to just totally fall off on it because usually even down the line I can rediscover the quality about it that made me love it so much in the first place and just kind of let that guide the experience. So even if I don't like appreciate it quite as much as I once did, um, it would be more likely to be like a comfortable slide from a 10 to a 7 than like a very drastic drop. Um, and then, how often do you feel that you can't find the words that pinpoint or describe a particular feeling in music? And do you think that paintings are more effective in capturing that than writing? I don't feel like anything is indescribable, but I don't think I felt that way in the beginning. Um, I think this is just because I've been making so many reviews in the past few years and had so much practice with this. Um, like, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at just latching onto my natural reactions to things and describing them in ways that don't sound like a jumbled mess. But that really is the issue, is it just sounding like a mess when you try to say it out loud or is it making you look kind of weird when you say it. Um, but I have faith that anyone could. Um, and honestly, I feel like when I'm making a painting, um, I have to fixate a lot more on my 
immediate instinctual reactions to albums as a whole. So things like how aggressive it sounds or how dreamy it sounds, which would be really obvious to just put in a review, but kind of have to become the entire basis of the painting and like hold it together emotionally, if you know what I mean. And then the entire rest of the process is just making sure everything is logically placed and compositionally sound, but still interesting to look at and hopefully as evocative as it can be. So it's just like I'm working with a different part of my brain because I feel like when I'm making a review, um, because I can literally say everything I get out of an album, um, it's more just about working with like a bajillion different thoughts at once and just trying to like sequence them in a way that's logical and make all of the sentences concise and stuff like that. So yeah, if anything, I feel like it's easier for me to write a review, honestly. Um, and I like doing it because I'm sure that I'm saying everything, I guess. Also, honestly, what I immediately picture when I hear a guitar is very different from what I immediately picture when I hear a synth. And that would obviously be completely irrelevant to a review, but actually play into how a painting ends up looking, so. This person also asked, thinking back to your hot take segment in your 1k sub Q&A, do you still agree with all of those? Um, I think maybe I was just exaggerating a little bit with some of them. Like, I don't think at this point I would passionately say that Frank Ocean or Mitski are overrated, but... I mean, I just don't think that being able to see an artist's talents and merits, but just not being in love with their work is all that noteworthy at all. And I just don't have very many legitimately controversial opinions. And when I do, I don't really feel particularly compelled to go out of my way to express them just because all these guys are fundamentally doing is making art that people enjoy. Like, I just think the whole concept of hot takes is a little bit dumb, and if you want to legitimately give criticism, it should be a lot more respectful and well thought out than just listing things off carelessly. But, I mean, I still hate Pinkerton and don't really enjoy Clarence Clarity, and don't really enjoy Brockhampton either. Congrats on 6k, I've been watching for a couple years and your work means a lot. Thank you so much for sticking around for that long and I love you. Congrats on 6k, you famously watched so many films that it leaves others green with envy. In the past two years since the last Q&A, have you seen any good movies? I've actually seen every single movie that's come out in the past two years. Um, I'm a really big film buff, I don't let anything slip by me. Um, so off top right now, you know, I can't really remember what my favorites have been because again, I've just seen so many films, um, but just know that I've seen a lot of films. Also love you, Liam, miss you, and, um, I hope you're doing well. Um, I've, I don't watch movies, if you didn't catch on to the sarcasm. What is an album you can always go back to whenever you need to feel better? An album that you can be sure will give you a great experience every single time. I myself have been listening to Dots and Loops a lot throughout the quarantine, and it's been my main go-to album for the past couple of months now. Um, good pick. For me, I think any Milo album, Things That Happen at Day Night, is like a super, like, feel good experience for me, at least internally. Um, that thing is just so colorful when it comes to like vocabulary and just nerdy references and the beats are just irresistible to me. So it pulls me out of disinterest in music really well. Um, what was the last live show you attended before the pandemic started? Which artists do you look forward to seeing most when shows come back? Uh, I think that was Danny Brown. Shout out to Brett if you're watching this. And um, I bought a ticket to see uh, Godspeed You Black Emperor in February, which I'm very excited about. And um, I want to see Swans and Sun at some point in my life. Besides that, uh, there are so many artists that I would love to have the experience of seeing live. Um, 
like too many to list, but those are the two that come to my mind right now um, that I've like fantasized about in the past, I guess. What's your favorite Mount Erie album or favorite album cover of all time? Um, I think my favorite Mount Erie album is Lost Wisdom and my favorite album cover of all time is probably Spiderlands cover which you might hear something about in the near future. And then uh, what's the best and worst album art you know? Um, best, again, is Spiderland. Um, in terms of worst, I mean, I really can't think of like one off top that is like obviously the worst I've ever seen. Um, although I, I, I feel compelled to say, despite turning around on Schlagenheim as an album, I still don't like the cover art like at all. Um, in a way, it does kind of fit the music, but I just find it dreadful to look at, and um, yeah. But at the same time, I could see why someone would like it or find find it to be kind of artful, but I just, I just don't. Favorite Radiohead album? Um, I feel like that would be either Kid A or In Rainbows. I could see it going either way, really. Um, the rest of their albums I don't find to be quite as consistent or well-written, or they just have an identity that doesn't look quite as good on them as a band. Like, I tend to gravitate more towards their warm art rock and electronic stuff as opposed to their alt rock stuff. But um, those two just don't miss a beat. They're perfectly paced. Um, I love some of the more weird, unhinged moments on Kid A. And I feel like the very resonant but cold and detached electronics are just something that I will always feel this immediate emotional bond with. I feel like the way this record portrays just losing grip of reality through dissociation with very vague lyricism um, and also just some of the more political and apocalyptic themes on this thing are incredibly tangible. Um, and In Rainbows is maybe the most airtight Radiohead album there is to me. Um, I'm not gonna say it has the best songwriting of any Radiohead album, but it's pretty damn close. And I find that just so many lines on this record hit the nail on the dot to some of the most broken and unsolvable aspects to life as a whole. Um, and again, it's to the point where it feels suffocating to listen to and to think about. But it's like at the same time, this record's sound has such a bright, attractive glow and such an affectionate warmth to it. And it just makes you want to latch right onto it and not let go. But, um, the way that Tom York vocally kind of expresses these sentiments just ties knots in your stomach or it puts a tightness in your stomach that does not leave or get fucked with for the entire duration of the record. That's part of the reason why I find it to be so impactful. What's your listening setup? How do you usually listen to music? Um, so I, the majority of the time, listen to music on headphones. I have Bose over-ear sound links. Um, but I do also have like clip speakers, um, which I will sometimes use like late at night if I'm like laying down and just don't want to have big ass headphones on or say like in the morning if I'm getting ready or if I have friends over or something like that. But um, if I am trying to actually like become immersed in an album, I'm going to be listening on headphones. Um... I just wanted to say that I really admire the way you articulate yourself and your passion for music and your visual art really expresses the same sentiment and emotions incredibly. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that you kind of view them as linked in that way. Hope you're doing well mentally and staying hopeful and positive, doing my best. Um, my question would be which artist did you listen to the most during quarantine? So. I wanted to give you an exact answer, so I looked through my last FM, and apparently that's Milo. Big surprise. Um, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on what makes for good noise or really just good, harsh, extreme music in general, as it's an area that, while you don't cover it super often, you seem more comfortable in and with than a lot of other folks in music review spaces outside of the very tiny handful who specialize in it. Um, this might be vague, but I feel like it just essentially can't feel like a shit show. Um, having like a balance of frequencies that evoke something specific can help. 
um, having some semblance of melody can help, having a progression that's generally engaging can help, like, there are a lot of different things that can do this, and I think, um, it pretty much just depends on what type of music more specifically you're trying to make, because this is all just, like, for harsh noise, but, um, you did say just generally extreme music, which could, um, kind of, uh, include a lot of different things, so yeah. Um, also, unrelatedly, what has most informed your prose style as a critic? For as much as the term video essay is bandied about to mean a lot of different things, your work f feels very distinctly literary in its tenor, not pretentious or overwrought, just carefully worded and very richly descriptive in a way more typical of prose work. This isn't a jab at other people on the platform, simply an observation. I do rather like it, though. Um, well, can't anything technically be called prose? Like, isn't, like, everything you say on a daily basis technically prose? Um, I also, like, wanted to link this together with another question because, um, I could answer them in a very similar way. Um, how would you say your writing process has evolved over the years in terms of things like structuring, methodology, whatever, and do you ever take the time to look at past reviews to critically analyze any potential spots for growth that you, at the time, might not have been aware of? Absolutely love the content, keep doing what you're doing. Again, thank you. There's so many different things that I could say in my answers to these questions, it's genuinely kind of overwhelming, but, um, I think generally speaking, the way my channel has developed over time has been pretty subconscious to me. This is just where I've ended up. Um, I do feel like my reviews, generally speaking, are more subjectively analytical than other people's, and um, I do tend to kind of angle them more towards the aspects of a piece of art that I find there to be the most value in as opposed to like an even balance of everything that they're trying to say or what the piece really means like more broadly culturally in the grander scheme of music and i think i do want to consider things a bit more broadly in the future but um i feel like a lot of other people are already doing the latter very well and i do think that if you put too much emphasis on how a new piece of art resembles art that's already existed it can pretty quickly get reductive unless it's just blatantly derivative um but i don't know i just feel like even if your end goal is to talk about why an artist creates in the way they do and their intentions and all of that, um, you have to go through your subjective associations to things if you want to describe them in a way that is the most natural and impactful. For right now, chasing subjectivity to this extent always leads me to the most unique end product possible by default. It's how I've approached everything I've done creatively in the past, and I feel like because I naturally care the most this way and I feel such a bond with what I do, I also end up growing in the ways that feel most worth it to me like because I've done this channel what I can kind of see in music has just expanded tenfold I also feel like I just fixate more on small parts of life and reality and nature and things like that which definitely lends itself well to writing poetry and just experiencing life more vividly in general but at the end of the day I do still see what I do as analytical and I feel like it's made me a better and more concrete thinker and just strengthen the left side of my brain so much and changed how much I value learning in general, which is kind of changing the entire direction I'm wanting to steer my life in in the future. Um, because I do have to juggle so many ideas and just weird sensations at once when I'm writing. Like, for example, in a track, some small quality of the imagery in the songwriting and the instrumental and the vocal delivery might all kind of connect together and that is like the core reason why I love the track. Doing it this way, it's like I'm just breaking everything down into a loose concept and then bringing them all back together in a way that makes me feel this very strong sense of personal relevance, but also like I'm creating something of my own um, because I'm arranging words in a way that feels pleasantly strange and kind of abstract and different from anything I've seen out there, which coming from an artsier background, I just value more than anything and 
I feel like doing it this way generally just enhances my natural strengths and it just scratches every itch that I had going into this and it's like honestly the most comprehensive form of personal expression I've ever found for myself so yeah it's just generally the shit um I love the way you create vivid imagery to describe a feeling or reaction you have to certain albums or artists do you have a background in creative writing um so not officially if it counts um between the ages of like 10 and 13 i was really interested in that stuff i was like stupidly invested in writing fantasy novels for whatever reason and then um, later on i kind of just dropped that entirely i was like mildly interested in english subjects in middle school but all throughout high school that interest just totally dropped and then i think through doing this channel i kind of rediscovered it um and now here i am i'm interested in all of these humanity subjects so thank you music are you actively looking to bring diversity into your music rotations by listening more to particular artists i.e do you seek to listen to artists that have a particular identity implicit or explicit either in race land of origin sexuality gender etc this isn't something that crosses my mind in the immediate moment that i decide to turn on music and tailor it to my mood I do think that when I'm on the internet internalizing things to listen to later, the artists do end up being decently diverse, at least in terms of race and gender and sexuality, but I do think that I could do a better job of listening to more artists from different lands of origin. And honestly, I do think that I could just do a better job of this in general and be more intentional about it because I do think that music can be a really effective communicator of some of the things that you might not feel as much natural empathy for if you're just kind of reading about it in dry language on a screen or on a page or whatever. Um, Congrats on 6k, thank you. Opinions on Jesu or Jesu or whatever, both the band in general and their self-titled debut. So, the two albums of theirs I've heard, um, Conquer and the self-titled, I've found to be slightly exhausting as full listens, but it's strange because I feel like I naturally care about them a little bit more than I care about most music. It's like they bring me back to this default state I have where everything in the world looks a little bit more unreal or surreal and completely broken and just unable to be fixed, but also a little bit magical or mystical in a way. If you're listening to them, I would say expect layers of just heavy crushing guitars that feel like electric motors or bulldozers that have just like dirt flying out of them. And then just these bleary melodies that bleed with pain and kind of melt into everything else in the tracks and melt into your head. Simultaneously there are like sustained guitar notes that are a little bit higher and those to me kind of feel like just being stuck in this moment of peril for like way longer than is natural because I feel like when you're in a state of panic or you're anxious it kind of comes in like a quick flash but um, this is just like you're stuck there. And so these are pretty uncomfortable experiences to me for those reasons, I feel like. Or it's like the sheer weight of those records in combination with the melodies is just like representative of pain trying to enter your body, but you just trying to block it off. So it really has to just force its way through and add this like physical weight to your body, um, which is equally uncomfortable <laughs> um and neurosis best or worst of those albums you've listened to if you haven't listened to all i've only heard three neurosis records so all i can say is times of grace is better than through silver and blood which is better than the eye of every storm what characteristics do you look for in albums you choose to review <laughs> um i review albums that come out when i'm ready to make a whole review and that interest me like i think it's usually a dead giveaway that I'm gonna try to cover an album if, as I'm kind of taking notes on it, I'm just firing off all of this imagery that I haven't really used a lot in past reviews, or like if I find the themes that it covers to be genuinely thought-provoking and the idea of talking about them excites me. Do you like Blade, favorite Blade project? I do! And 
I think that he's a weird instance to where imperfect vocals are actually beneficial and kind of make his music and become the centerpiece of it because I imagine in certain moments anyway he wants to represent what it would be like if you just were completely taken over by and piloted by your immediate natural human temptations like in a romantic sense and for fame and to have an ego and things like that when i listen to him i literally just feel like i'm spilling out into this puddle of useless vulnerable emotions i just feel like a mess but then he still communicates the same when he comes through with a strong vocal melody because his voice has a certain whine or an exaggerated waver about it that just does it. And something I felt like I was actually really picking up on lyrically with his last project is that of course it is full of like dumb references and language, but between all of that he will just drop the most rawly wise and heavy shit randomly. Like he'll be like, get litty or pop out like a toast and then all of a sudden he's talking about how you have to chase these highs because you have to live and you can just detach from all of it and see it as more of a concept than something that's actually happening and it's like that's the closest you could get to justifying something like this. It's like almost emotionally intelligent, if you know what I mean. I think my favorite project of his is still Ice Dancer because I just find it to be scary satisfying as a whole listen. I think the transitions are just spot on and I'm just so naturally swept up by it to the point where the tracks that are a little more scant don't necessarily seem like as much of an issue. I also find that the beats have a certain nocturnal glow about them that I'm really attracted to and such an incredible sense of space and atmosphere. I also think that for whatever reason Blade's vocal melodies just hit those beats in exactly the right way on this project. Blade just evokes a really weirdly specific mix of things for me like some frat boy aesthetics but also like his music kind of makes me feel like I'm in an icy kingdom or I'm surrounded by aliens and it's all just hyper emotional and sensitive. I don't know it's just listening to him is kind of a strange experience, but I like it. Thoughts on Joanna Newsom. Um, so I actually almost find it intimidating just how intelligent and multi-talented she comes across and her music is just really richly sophisticated and her songwriting just has so much depth about it so that definitely contributes to it but at the same time i feel like her music really just maintains this sense of childlike wonder which i find to be really admirable and then someone else asked what's your favorite joanna album and that would probably be have one on me do you find you're inclined to listen to music that indulges your current emotional or mental state, or do you prefer to contradict it? After a long, shitty day, would you throw on something grinding and broken, or would you want to hear something brighter and encouraging? Um, I definitely don't try to contradict my natural emotional states because it just doesn't work. If there does happen to be an album that I know I'm gonna want to talk about in the best way possible down the line, um, or just some album that I want to get to know more deeply for whatever reason and it happens to kind of align with that emotional state, I'll try to take advantage of it and think about it more deeply, but um, sometimes I just like want the emotion to pass more easily so I don't really want to fixate on it like that and I'll just end up throwing on whatever's been interesting me recently. Do you have Letterboxd? No, I don't watch films. Uh, what are some of your favorite films? <laughs> I don't really watch films again, but I will tell you that Donnie Darko is a movie that I consider to be pretty close to my heart. I just feel bad saying that because like I know there would probably be so many more if I watched more movies. Favorite movies and books, um, and then Sophia said, why are you the love of my life? Um, I don't know. Nah, but in all seriousness, any book recommendations as of late? And then I'm pretty sure one other guy asked, like, top five books. So I guess we're ready for the amateur book discussion part of this Q&A. Let me grab my stack of books, and please by no means consider these to be my favorite books of all time definitively. I literally just started taking an interest in reading, so this is pretty much just kind of what I've picked up. Um, and I wouldn't say that there are even recommendations either. Basically with each of these, if you have any familiarity with the subject it falls under, you've probably already heard of it. But 
Um, with that being said, first one I wanted to give a shout out to is Fear and Trembling by Soren Kierkegaard. This is probably the most philosophical and linguistically dense novel that I have here. Um, it follows a story in the Bible of Abraham and Isaac where God tells Abraham that he has to kill his only son as an act of faith in him. And basically, what Kierkegaard is saying is that um, by being willing to go through with it and just ignore everyone around him calling him crazy and undergo this intense kind of internal battle and just allow this to eat him alive and act basically in faith of something that's just completely impossible. He is this supremely noble knight of faith and if he were to just accept the facts as they are and act ethically and refuse to kill his only son, he would be a knight of infinite resignation, which would still be noble, but he's just trying to put as much power in Abraham as possible and what he did and basically show that things like God and love are like exceptions to the rule in a sense. Next up, I'm sure many of you have heard of this one. Mark Fisher, Capitalist Realism. Um, this is a short bit of theory where Fisher explains what he's termed capitalist realism. Realism to mean this ideological lens through which we see reality. It's essentially him talking about how we've internalized that the only means to a functioning economy is through capitalism, and this affects all of our priorities and goals and everything we think about every day and pretty much everything, and it blocks off thought and action. And something that I found really interesting that I read about in this is the idea of inner passivity or a piece of media that tackles a serious issue and essentially tricks your brain into thinking that it's doing something to help the problem just by consuming. Or it's like it tricks your brain into thinking that someone else is already taking care of it. Basically, it scratches the itch you have to help and pacifies you and has the reverse effect that you would want it to. And essentially, alternative media like this is just another commodity and the only cracks through which we can see the faults of capitalism are within bureaucracy and the declining state of the environment and in the declining mental health of so many people and it's our job to expose these cracks to the greatest extent that we can and it's also very very short so i wouldn't be too intimidated by it next up i have crime and punishment a classic. Uh, this is by Fyodor Dostoevsky. It's both a fiction novel and a work of philosophy because when you start to analyze it, ethics comes up pretty fast. It's about a main character who decides to murder an old pawnbroker and tries to justify his actions and by the end his perspective on what he's done changes. Wealth and specifically what the lack of wealth can drive someone to do is a pretty big theme at play here and I also think this thing is just very richly descriptive specifically when it comes to the psychological journey that the main character goes through and it's incredibly suspenseful. The narrative is just super well paced and exciting and it's quite dark in tone, um, easy to read. would definitely say pick it up if you're looking for some kind of mental stimulation. Um, next up, I wanted to recommend a book that I actually left at work. <laughs> um, it is Energy Flash by Simon Reynolds, our very own Simon Reynolds. Um, it's essentially just an in-depth history of electronic music, um, which I haven't read it cover to cover because it is quite thick, but I find that if I ever just kind of want to read up on the history behind a certain subgenre or a specific movement, it's right there for me. I would say if you're interested in some specific part of music history, just pick up a book on it. It's a really easy way to just become more educated on these things. And next up I have The Red Book by Carl Jung, of course. This is Psychoanalysis. Um, I haven't finished this, but it doesn't strike me as something that I would have to finish to talk about. It is essentially him illustrating what's happening to his brain as he's going through these self-induced waking dreams and hallucinations and the mythical and biblical figures and symbols that are kind of surfacing from this. Um, this is where he defined the collective unconscious, I believe. And also I'm picking up on this thing recurrently throughout this novel about balance and 
essentially how you need whatever is opposite or evil to your current life mindset or philosophy. And you can't live both of these things at once, but you have to continually be changing your current situation in order to truly be happy or one with yourself. I could be slightly off there, but there's definitely a lot of emphasis on balance in this thing, which is something that I greatly appreciate and need to be reminded of right now. Um, next up, there was one question about YouTube channels and the ones that I watched before I started making videos, the ones that inspired me to make videos, and what I currently kind of watch now. I'm really glad that someone asked this. I never get a chance to talk about how many people on here just inspire me so much. In the beginning, when I was kind of writing on my blog in late 2017, I stumbled upon this group of small reviewers on YouTube, which um, I was kind of intimidated by, but I really wanted to be friends with. And I noticed that um, a video format actually does make you feel a lot more connected to the reviewer in a way that is special and just doesn't quite come through in writing in the same way. So that's part of why I decided to change my stuff over to a video format. And in terms of YouTubers that I watch now for fun or to keep up on things I'm interested in, I do watch a lot of just what comes up on my recommended, but I have subscribed to a lot of channels too and kind of find myself recurrently watching the same ones. So when it comes to music, I watch a lot of not real music. Um, his videos are quite casual and they really just kind of feel like talking to your friend in your room about an album you both just heard. It's like really cozy and I think ideal. Um, and I also want to shout out Rick the Lie. I find that his videos just make me really excited to try to get creative and talk about music in new ways. And he also just has a really vast knowledge of music as a whole, which is quite admirable. And I also want to shout out the wonky angle. I find that he has a really vast knowledge of specifically electronic music and um, I could probably learn something from him. I do watch Anthony's videos a bit specifically for insight on what influences what if I'm not covering an album because I don't know if you've picked up on this but I can kind of suck at this. Um, and then when it comes to channels that aren't music related that I still watch, I want to shout out Philosophy Tube. She covers social issues in a way that's really rich and informative, but also very accessible and creative, and they're really enjoyable. Plastic Pills and Epic Philosophy make videos on continental philosophy. They're always really followable and just visually stimulating, and I really feel like they're doing something special, so shout out to them, and I wish them all the success in the world. I also watch quite a few like random book channels, which I wouldn't want to shout all of them out, but I will say specifically, Intellect Grime is a channel that just warms my heart. She talks about poetry and philosophy and literature and just everything good in the world. And she is a smaller channel. She kind of infrequently uploads, but I still do really like her. Um, the Rational National is like a left-leaning political commentator that I find I agree with a lot of the time. And I also really like the way his videos are formatted. Um, I will also say that even though I don't watch films, Deep Focus Lens is a channel that I'm very glad exists because she just kind of reminds me of someone that I would want to be like years down the line and makes me feel more okay being myself and just about life in general. So I've gotten about as much out of her channel as you could get if you don't really regularly watch films. Thoughts on Cope? Cope? Um, I have no idea who this is, and apparently I can't pronounce her name either. I have a few questions, no particular order. If you could punch anyone in the face as hard as possible, who would it be? God is an acceptable answer. Damn, I wouldn't punch God. I feel like I shouldn't answer this. <laughs> I mean, I guess, like, anyone who hurts someone who has been there for me is someone that I would like to punch in the face. Um, do you think it's possible to breed a bull mastiff with a chihuahua? The chihuahua is the male. Um, do I look like a dog breeder? I, I don't know. I don't really care either, honestly. <laughs> um, universe, infinite or finite? I feel like if you're talking about the entire universe, it would have to be infinite, right? I don't know. Um, what is your least favorite vegetable? Nicolas Cage doesn't count. Don't worry, I wasn't gonna say Nicolas Cage. And, um... 
I really don't like raw broccoli. Um, I also don't like carrots, whether they're cooked or raw, so I guess probably carrots are worse. Um, additional question, what the hell do bears eat anyway? Um, can't you Google this? Like, I feel like this is a pretty Googleable question, and I'm not exactly the best source, uh, to go to for this, I think. Anyway, <laughs> what are some of your favorite music videos? Um... I legit feel like I just haven't seen enough to feel confident answering what my favorites really are. Um, also, how are you doing? I have no idea, honestly. I do suppress a lot, but I do have good days and um, I'm generally pretty functional right now, which is a plus. In my immediate life, day to day, everything does feel a little bit fake, trivial, um, almost like a joke in extreme cases. Um, but if I ever acknowledge how I truly feel about the past or things that mean more to me, I'm not functional. I kind of just black out. Um, I feel like I've lost so many things, like just so many people that used to mean the world to me, so many things that used to mean the world to me. And I know this is pretty common, but it just makes me feel every day like everything is really absurd and weird. And it's like, I'm just a stranger to all of the versions of myself that have existed in the past. And I don't really know who I am. Um, and also the past six months were pretty terrible. So now I'm starting to get out of that. And I genuinely just feel really confused a lot of the time. It's like, I just woke up out of a coma or something um and i do feel pretty disconnected from my life but i don't think that that's my worst option right now so yeah <laughs> given the level of detail that goes into your reviews and interpretations how long do your reviews usually take to write build and record until you're satisfied with the end result a long time i don't have an exact number of hours for you because i don't keep track but um my past two reviews took me longer than reviews used to take me so it's just increasing and i'm hoping to find a way to kind of cut back on the amount of time it takes me just so i can like upload more i just hate having this perfectionist bug that just eats me alive because at some point <laughs> i'll be uploading like two videos a year or something at this rate and um, i would rather that not happen congrats on the 6k love your vids thank you who are your favorite lyricists um i feel like that's so many artists like that's like every fucking artist <laughs> i appreciate so many different approaches to lyrics but um probably david tibet would have to make the list and isaac brock would maybe like jordan dreyer of law dispute probably Milo and Aesop Rock, maybe Fiona Apple. How do you define success on your own projects? Um, <laughs> I feel like I never know how I actually feel about my own stuff until like way down the line. Like, I feel like I only just came to terms with the fact that like half my paintings look great and half of them are just totally throwaway or a dime a dozen. And it's like so easy for me to come to these conclusions now that I'm out of it. But like when you're in that state of like creating things, it's just like you're blind to so much. Um, but in the moment, seriously, there is only like, I think this is mostly adequate by my standards or like what I'm trying to do, or this definitely isn't adequate by my standards or what I'm trying to do. And there's really no in between. If you had to only listen to one genre of music for the rest of your life, what genre would it be? I don't know if I'm allowed to say like an umbrella genre that just kind of encompasses a lot, but if so, electronic? Um, have you ever thought of reviewing a film score and how it enhanced the film in different ways? Dude, I've seen like three movies, <laughs> so I think you can assume that I have no background in film criticism. And I know this is like the score specifically, but I still think it would be really amateurish and kind of uncomfortable. What's your favorite live album? I'm honestly not sure. Um, maybe Rock Dream by Mersbo and Boris, but there might be a better answer to this question that I'm just kind of forgetting in the moment. Um, top five post-punk albums. Um, so I did write down a list for this just because it's kind of hard to think about these things off top. Um, 
I would say plowing into the field of love, sun coming down, public strain, um, relatives in descent, and um, if you count it, uh, I would say deceit by this heat. I know you could see that as more experimental rock. I do think it is more experimental rock, but yeah. Um, and then I thought about saying Silent Alarm, but I think that's more like dance punk or post-punk revival. Hi, this is Shira from Patreon. I love you. Always reading your posts there and proud of you. Thank you. Love you too. My question is, are there any particular songs, I'm asking in plural because for me it's this way, that you cannot even bring yourself to listen to again, although you wish you could because they make you too sad, either because of the songs themselves or something personal they're related to? Um... The vast majority of the time, no. I find that if a song is connected to a memory for me, um, all of the other qualities of the song kind of like stand out to me more at this point anyway, because I have so many songs that are connected to memories for me. So the only thing that really like makes me relive that memory through the song is me actively thinking about it first before I go into the track. Um, but in terms of music that kind of scares me because it makes me too sad, um, the glow part two, for some reason, always just immediately kind of makes vulnerable emotions surface in me. Um, and I'm usually very good at just suppressing all that shit. You could call me something of like a queen of suppression, but um, yeah, it just gets me. And on a very similar note to that, have you ever formed an association with a piece of music, be it an album or a single track, that turned sour and left you almost physically unable to listen to that piece? Um, if you ever play Trilogy by The Weeknd around me and I decide to pay attention, I will likely just projectile vomit all over the place. <laughs> um, change in mindset. And I still think that the record is very effective at what it does almost for that exact reason. Tell us more about your experience with Jim O'Rourke's Eureka. Also, have you heard David Grubbs' solo albums post Gaster Del Sol? They're equally fantastic. I have not, but I can definitely talk about Eureka. Um, I feel like Jim O'Rourke's presence on any album just adds this coldness or cynicism or like a sarcasm or a mocking tone. Um, and it's so funny hearing that on like a symphonic pop record that has such grandeur to it, that has like this suave, sophisticated look about it and just is generally all dressed up in that way. Um, but in, at the same time, it's like each of these things just balance each other out in the most unexpectedly perfect way, I feel like. Um, kind of just reminds me of how like yeah you do get through life just kind of laughing at all of it and just making fun of all the clear bullshit that's thrown your way and it's like simultaneously life is actually that emotionally heavy which i feel like is just completely communicated through the core arrangements here like tracks like through the night softly and please patronize our sponsors just kind of sound like lullabies in a deafeningly still or silent night right before the end of existence. Um, and I feel like when it comes to the latter, the way that it's just swept up by those circling pianos in the second half and these tear jerking strings just rip their way through eagerly but timidly is like one of the most freaking sincerely sorrowful moments on the whole thing. And of course, melodrama is kind of an aspect of all of this, like with the trumpets on the second half of Movie on the Way Down, which just sound like they're lamenting the main character's life being in shambles or his life resembling like a shipwrecked voyage. But then Jim O'Rourke's delivery over it just kind of makes it feel a little bit tongue in cheek and changes the the function of that instrumental a little bit and it's kind of like he's giving it a bit less power but it's still like all right there and um as far as who he is on this record he just comes across as really detached and aloof <laughs> like on ghost ship in a storm he's kind of seeing himself from the outside and acknowledging how out of it he is day to day but then that's juxtaposed with this overly chipper instrumental so again it's like it has a tongue-in-cheek kind of effect there's something about him on this record that just comes across as about as honest as one could be about their natural asshole tendencies which is exactly why movie on the way down is so difficult for me to listen to like you have that entire instrumental suspenseful first half and then that more naked second half just kind of lays itself down and you have Jim O'Rourke just singing like 
vaguely, how does anyone feel pride in this world? And I just feel this suffocating sense of shame coming from him. Um, and then there's Happy Holidays, which is just kind of like a snappy ending to the record. And you have that mention of women with no clothes on and just drowning out the reality of life with the radio. Um, so I'm always thinking like, he is realizing that fulfillment in the way that he previously wanted it is just completely impossible and the only way that he can kind of find happiness or border on happiness in this life is just to become totally ignorant to things that he already knows are true. And then there's that line, I only came to leave, which he sings in the most gut-wrenching way possible. And it just makes me think that he's acknowledging that he's just jumping from phase to phase in his life and entering each new one, knowing that he's just gonna bolt in the opposite direction eventually, just so he doesn't get too disillusioned. Um, and there is that mention of Mouth Canyon, which could imply legitimate suicide. I never quite saw it in that way, but either way, it's very difficult to stomach. Um, and then on the opposite side of everything, you kind of have something big where he's saying like, yeah, I'll always just kind of try to make up for this emptiness with these grand ambitions and plans that I'm completely the wrong guy to carry out, but I'm still gonna do it. <laughs> I also love the opener. Um, I find the instrumental to just be life affirming. And I love the idea of a guy like Jim O'Rourke acknowledging that the naturally emotional quality in women is actually actually something that he could learn from. Um, yeah, just generally, it strikes me as one of the most honest records I've ever heard, and I really resonate with the personality behind it. And yeah, um, do you like Sweet Trip? And if so, are you excited for their new album this year? I do. Um, I'm sorry it took me so goddamn long to get around to making this because now the album's already out, but I have heard it and I liked it. I think it's my least favorite in their discography so far just because it kind of retreads a lot of similar ground as their past releases, but um, I think Velocity Design Comfort is an incredibly dynamic, multifaceted record. It has like this cutesy, digitized cartoon character personality about it and a lot of melodic sweetness, but then at the same time, it's like listening to that record is like looking at a screen that's constantly like blinking and glitching. It's really disorienting and just... It's very spastic and explosive. It makes me feel like I'm right around all this hardware or electrical wiring that's just full of static and sparks and things like that. Um, but I overall find it to be successful despite it being a lot at times. And I especially really like the track Dedicated. And then You Will Never Know Why is also cool. Um, I haven't heard it in a while. I do remember it being more straightforward and melodic. It's just kind of like an indie pop shoegaze record. However, I think by default, there would have been more focus on the vocals on that record, which is kind of a turnoff for me. I don't really find them to be that compelling as vocalists, but I think Halica Bliss Out is probably their most underrated record. I love how the instruments on that thing just sound like they're being released freely into it or they're like exhaling or something like that um, it's like they're fluidly snaking through the tracks and listening to it as a whole just makes you feel like you're being caught in some kind of like lazy river or something and I don't think it's perfect front to back but um, if you're not in heaven for like the entirety of a track like fish I really don't know what to tell you I had kind of a moment with that track recently where I decided I was completely done with something that had been weighing me down for so long and I basically just went in the exact opposite direction, just full force and um, just felt so inspired and like infatuated and just all these amazing feelings of like newness kind of hit my body and it just felt like I was just being bathed head to toe in light and color and just every crevice of me was being affected and oh my god, um, yeah. <laughs> do you like Converge? And if so, what's your favorite album from them? Um, I do, I think they've just been cranking out solid record after solid record for so many years now. The only reason why I don't return to their stuff more is just because metalcore is not necessarily something that I gravitate towards by default but I think my favorite album from them is gonna be Jane Doe. There are some tracks on there that are just fucking mind-blowing. Least favorite subgenre of music. Um, I honestly hate admitting this, but I still don't really enjoy trap that much. 
Best album from 1994. This is very specific, so I looked into it in advance. And I think Of Ruin or Some Blazing Star by Current 93 is what I landed on. What are your five favorite electronic albums? So my five favorites are probably going to go something like Mezzanine by Massive Attack, Immunity by John Hopkins, Replica by One of Tricks Point Never, of course, and then something like Nymphs by Nicholas Jar and Fever Ray self-titled after that, but there are a lot of contenders, and please by no means take this list as just my permanent list of favorite electronic albums. And what's my favorite BOC track? This is probably going to be an eagle in your mind, actually. I'm not sure I gave this track quite enough credit in my best to worst, like I legitimately don't remember, but it definitely sticks out to me, it's just exceptionally magical in their discography. How have your music tastes changed over the years? Like, what music did you listen to when you were younger? Well, um, in the earliest days of my life, I definitely just listened to the radio and whatever was popular, whatever I would pick up on by default. My family is not really that invested in music, so I kind of had to pick up this hobby by myself. And then at some point, I became really invested in all of these shitty pop punk bands and then from there, it was like a slow crawl to a random Britpop phase that I can't really explain. And then at some point, I started using the internet a lot more and discovered all of these music nerd classics or albums that would just appear on Topsters recurrently and um, listen to all of those. And then I was kind of invested in hip hop for a little bit there, believe it or not. And then at some point I started taking this a bit more seriously and settled into basically what I would consider my current tastes now. I naturally gravitate towards abstract, textured electronic stuff, anything with kind of like a dark, moody atmosphere about it. So I'm talking about genres like ambience and industrial and post-industrial and... IDM and house and techno and trip hop and honestly I don't really see that changing anytime soon. Are you excited for new arcade fire material? Moderately, like I don't think I'm gonna just feel my world crashing down if they don't release anything, but if they do I'll listen to it. Yay 6k, I'm so proud of you. Thank you Chris. Old school project from any genre you wanted to check out but never got around to. Um, there are so many, like way too many to just list, but I do want to listen to a lot more experimental stuff from the 60s and 70s. Favorite B-side or single exclusive remixes? I truly have no idea. <laughs> um, fancy coffee or ordinary coffee? Well, definitely fancy coffee. I mean, I don't know what this hypothetically fancy coffee really logistically entails, but I'm assuming it's better than just your average drip coffee. Um, are you into electronic music? I am. If so, what are your favorite albums and albums you consider massively underrated in the genre? So I already said my five favorite electronic albums, but when it comes to albums that I think are pretty underrated, I made a list. Um, and the two I want to put the most emphasis on are Two Muchachos, The Forest Is Not What It Seems. If you like ambient and dark ambient stuff, this is one of my favorite records of all time. I also think Drop Sound by Biosphere is about as good as Substrata, if not better. And then Drawn and Quartered by Deadbeat and First Floor by Theo Parrish are two random records that I found quite a lot of enjoyment in. Um, and then there are some recent down buzz records that I've dug, like Yellow River Blue by Yusu, Heart Failure by Common of a Go, 10 Billion Angels by Zora Jones, the Ambivalent EP by Kessler, this new Monolake project, C to C by Sign Libra, there was Main Pop Girl 2019. I also think the new Ski Mask record from this year is just phenomenal. There's New Slaves by Zeese. I also think that Ben Frost and Andy Stott have really solid discographies. And honestly, I wanted to give a brief shout out to this Rhythm of Sound compilation. I didn't love it, but it's something that I feel like a lot of people could find some enjoyment in. It's ambient dub if you like ambient dub. And then there are a few like DJ mixes, um, 
like DJ Kicks by Laurel Halo, Where a Dance Floor Stands Still by DJ Sprinkles, and Frankie Knuckles did this thing at the Ministry of Sound in 91 that I think is pretty phenomenal. Why do some people insist to turn at the end of the lane instead of merging onto the highway as soon as the checkered lines start? Okay, so I've read this question so many times and I can't make sense of it. I'm assuming it's a trick question, but um, I might just be really slow. <laughs> <laughs> what album in Nicholas Jar's discography would you consider the most and least accessible? I really dig this question. Um, I think 2011 to 2017 is definitely his most accessible, but least accessible is a little bit harder to say. I would probably say Pomegranates because that is his most expansive and scattered record and it does kind of require a lot of patience and appreciation for texture and if you don't have those things it could kind of be a bumpy ride, but you could probably also make the case for Sinesis just because there are moments on that thing that are really bare and raw and you could perceive as stagnant if you're not like really ready to just sit there and soak in the moment. Um, and you could probably also say Telus. The reason why I wouldn't say Telus is because I just think it's so obviously full of interesting texture, but it does kind of just completely disregard structure. So yeah. Um... What, in your opinion, is the worst song from your favorite album? So, off of Replica, I would say the worst track is probably Up. Um, those drums are kind of a high, but I feel like the rest of the samples just aren't quite as subtly haunting as they think they are. Um, I still think it's a really good track, though. What are some of your musical guilty pleasures? We all got some. Mine is Coldplay. Love that band. I really don't believe in the idea of musical guilty pleasures. I feel like calling something a guilty pleasure kind of implies that you think certain music is okay to like and certain music isn't. I would just say embrace whatever you like. Thoughts on sewer slut and drum and bass and jungle in general? Any favorites within that category? So. Of course I dig these. I'm an electronic buff and I'm not some kind of monster. Um, the only sewer slut project I've heard is Draining Love Story and honestly, I didn't find it to be that stimulating and I thought the vocal samples and like the song titles and the way everything was framed was kind of not the best look, especially considering the actual content of the record, but um, Ultra Visitor by Square Pusher and If You're Into It, I'm Out of It by Christophe de Babylon are a few of my favorites in these categories. And even though the breakbeat isn't exclusive to these styles, I love how it can communicate anything from power to aggression to adrenaline to anxiety, just depending on the pattern and depending on what it's surrounded by um, and just the way that it can change the whole feeling of a track. Um, as someone who listens to a fairly wide array of styles of music, have you ever wondered whether there's one unifying aspect in all or most of your favorites? Like, is there some specific yet genre-independent thing that you seem to be consistently gravitating towards? No, because I feel like I, along with everyone else, am just constantly changing and the human experience and music as an art form are both too complex to really like answer this question or just boil it down to something simple. What's the most intrinsically confusing album experience you've ever had? Like an album that you can't really consider good nor bad, you just genuinely don't get what the artist was thinking. Bonus points if it's from an artist you otherwise like and respect, those are always the most baffling ones. It's so funny to me when this shit happens. Like. If I listen to a whole record and just the entire time I'm confused, I feel like that is an accomplishment in itself. <laughs> um, and then it's like, sometimes when you don't get what an artist was going for, it also kind of comes across like they actually missed the mark on what they were trying to do because it's like, why would anyone ever try to do this? It's just like scatterbrained on every level. Um, I feel like the closest example I have is 2020 by Richard Dawson. 
I know there are a few overtly anti-capitalist sentiments on that thing, but as like a whole body of work, that thing is so confusing to me. I don't know what the fuck most of the lyrics on that thing even are, and on top of it, the vocal performances and instrumentals just feel like they're attempting this quirkiness that's just falling flat on its face, honestly. On a similar note, what's an album or artist which described on paper sounds like something you'd love, but for some reason it just doesn't click for you? I always used to say Igloo Ghost as an answer to this question, but then I actually ended up loving his last album, so maybe his entire discography isn't the best shout, but I still find Neo Wax Bloom to be really overstimulating. Thoughts on Stereo Lab and favorite album by them? So I would say I like Stereo Lab, but I don't necessarily love them. And my favorite album by them is probably Dots and Loops. I'm gonna ask you the same question I ask everyone else. Do you listen to Autecker? Religiously. Thoughts on Long Season by Fishmans. So I don't find it to be quite as amazing as I once did, I think, but still, if you're looking for a project that just has some really obvious appeal to it, that just hits the bullseye intuitively and you don't even really need to think about, uh, this is definitely a great place to go. But despite the fact that the melodies are so um, easily recognizable and graspable, um, you could dissect this thing and just get more and more out of it because anything this likable has to be intelligently constructed in one way or another. Um, I feel like it makes me feel just totally weightless, but also gives me an adrenaline rush at the same time. I feel like the more I think about it, the more I feel like it takes me to this place where I just feel like everything's unrealistically euphoric in the world and it's all just going to be so much easier and better in the future. Um, like, I feel a sense of childlike wonder in this thing. When did you discover your love for music and what artist, album, or song made you discover it? Um, well, I feel like I've always loved music throughout my whole life, uh, but in the earlier days, it obviously didn't just affect my day-to-day -day life and run as deep as it runs now. Um, but at every phase of my life, I feel like I've found things to appreciate about the songs that I've been listening to. Um, and then I don't really think it's fair to like give all the credit to any one artist or album or song at this point, just cause I don't know. There are so many that I could say and I don't feel right about it. Um, what are some genres that you haven't really listened a lot to, but want to get into? Um, so the two that always come back to my head is like things that I could actually probably be obsessed with if I just like kept trying with them or soul and country. Um, are there some artists that you can't get into but you wish you could? Yeah, there are a lot of artists that uh, fall under this category for me. I think a pretty good example would be No Name. I know a lot of people like really love her, but I've never been able to get into her. I don't really find there to be anything that compelling about the way she writes or the production she's over a lot of the time or her deliveries, but I do think, technically speaking, she's a pretty skilled rapper. Um, congrats on 6k subs. Thank you. When you started getting into music, what were your favorite albums and opinions on them now? So, I'm gonna interpret this question as, like, when I seriously started getting into music, like, listening to a bunch of albums all the time, um, I used to really love Kid A and Funeral and Turn on the Bright Lights, and I still like all of them. Um, I love the first two, uh, Turn on the Bright Lights, I just find to be a little bit more inconsistent than I used to, but yeah, I mean, really, most Radiohead that I initially loved when I got into Radiohead, I still love now for the same reasons, and, um, Funeral, I just don't consider to really be an album that, like, defines me as a person, but, um, I do still think it's really compelling, and I love how just wildly passionate it is, but also how messy some of the mixes are and how those two things intersect. And the way that it talks about just losing your spark, your innocence, your hope, your love for things, and just realizing all at once and that feeling just crashing into you is really, really impactful. Um, and then again, as far as Turn on the Bright Lights goes, I just find it to be a little bit more inconsistent than I used to, but there are moments on it that I love even more, and sometimes for new reasons. Um, like, I still love Obstacle 1 and NYC and the new, and 
Stella Was a Diver now is like one of my favorite songs and I didn't ever used to think that much of it, but um, I mean, I find the guitar work to be amazing. I think it has a great progression to it. And it has one of the most intriguing uses of a metaphor that I've ever heard. So this track is like this promiscuous female figure and she's portrayed as like a scuba diver, which is supposed to be a metaphor for her like sexually getting down a lot. Um, and I find this to be perfect because there's also a line on this thing, the sea was so airtight. So I think of this as her kind of like being able to breathe and actually accepting just the emotional nothingness and everyone else kind of being just caught in the claustrophobia of love and we have to assume like reading the lyrics to this track that she's content with that but uh, Paul Banks is actually like fixating on her enough to write this song about her so clearly he isn't so um, indifferent towards her. And I don't even think that this is like a definitive intentional part of this album, but just the band's image in general really reminds me of someone who is middle-aged trying to thrive in a city as business-oriented as like New York and just kind of feeling their soul leave. Like obviously I'm just speculating here, but I imagine at this age you would have developed just such a thick numbness to all the ways that you're internally heartbroken by your life or the world because it's just kind of routine or reality at that point. So with that, any romantic or sexual endeavor that actually means something to you is that much more make or break and it's also just harder to find them so that's part of it and I think the track Say Hello to the Angels kind of covers a similar subject matter very effectively but basically I think the track just reminds me of how you kind of subconsciously try to block out the truth um, but it'll always just be waiting there trailing behind you like with their head underwater I imagine them just trying not to actually sense what's happening in the outside world but towards the very end of this track when Paul Banks just kind of like softly chants there's some things that's invisible there's some things you can't hide it's like the most eerie moment of the whole track to me because it's never explicitly spelled out what the problem is, but I feel like you kind of just instinctually know or can tell by these lines. I don't know if I'm just seeing this in the way I want to see it, but my point is, even though I love these albums about as much as I once did, different things are jumping out at me as worth paying attention to just due to new life experiences and new musical experiences and things like that. And I imagine it'll continue to be that way down the line. Next question is, which band or artist has the best or favorite discography? This is kind of difficult to answer. Um, just because I want to say an artist that's released a lot of albums just so it makes sense to say their entire discography is my favorite. And also, I mean, I want to say an artist that hasn't just released a lot of albums that I think are great but not exceptional, but I also don't want to say a discography that's too inconsistent, so maybe like Boris would be a good answer to this question. I'm also kind of tempted to say Milo, but the problem is then I would have to account for the projects he's released under other names when I think, generally speaking, the ones he's released specifically under Milo have been the most successful and have all just provided some essential insight on who he is as an artist that um, it wouldn't feel the same without, I guess. And I also did consider One of Tricks Point Never just because he always releases projects that interest me genuinely and um, don't necessarily feel like something I can directly compare to anything else, which I think is definitely an accomplishment. But at the same time, I don't think that he has a lot of projects that I would consider to be truly exceptional. So it's hard, um, but I'm going to go with Boris. And what 10 year span has the best albums, i.e. 94 to 2004? This is really like specific... So it's really hard to answer, but I'll just say generally, I'm really drawn to things that came out in the late 90s to early 2000s, so it would probably be some window in there. What year has been the worst year for music? Um, I feel like I would feel uncomfortable saying, like, I haven't explored enough, and 
even if I had explored more, um, I feel like it's it's not something that I want to like definitively say is the case because, I mean, you haven't listened to every album from any year, so you can't really say for sure at any point. So yeah, it just feels like um, not a sweeping declaration I want to make. Congrats on the milestone. Thank you. And also, what's your favorite pastry item and why is it chocolate babka? I don't know what that is, actually. I don't know if I'm just dumb, uncultured, something along that line, but I have no idea what this is. I can't picture it in my head, but yeah, it's great <laughs> if you're looking for validation. Um, I mean, I like cake. I like chocolate icing a lot. So we'll just say that. And then someone asked, have you ever thought about making music? And if so, what would it sound like? Who would you want to work with? Okay, so like honestly, at this point in my life, there is a long list of things that I would do first. Like I would so much rather just like read more and um, learn more about literature and philosophy and poetry and theology and mythology and history and politics and um, I would love to paint more. I would love to learn how to do my makeup better. I want to listen to more music. Like I feel like I can get into these patterns where I'm writing so much that I'm slacking on the very thing that would just naturally make me good at this in the first place. Like, there are just so many things that would come before music for me. Um, mostly because I just have no desire to learn how to work a new medium right now. Um, I would rather just kind of see what I can do with my current skill set and find ways to just stimulate my head intellectually and see if I can get things vaguely lined up for some cool new creative project down the line, which I have no idea what that's going to be, but um, I'm just trying to stay inspired right now. Um, like I've almost started certain things last year at this time. Um, I wanted to start making anatomical drawings that kind of depict how depression affects you physically. Um, I've also thought a lot about just taking photos in the middle of nowhere that look really lonely and desolate. I tend to overthink these things, but I never want to like really dive into something unless I'm completely sure that that's what I want to be doing. Um, if you were to ask me like, what kind of music would you make if you couldn't do anything else creative for the rest of your life, that would be different. And I truly have no idea what I would say. Like, I just feel like it could go so many different ways. And um, it's just a question that I would truly have to sit down and like seriously consider before settling on anything. But I imagine there's a good chance it could be electronic. If I do ever end up making music, I imagine it'll be like way down the line. Like, I've always kind of thought if you don't end up with kids or a husband or anything like that, you're probably gonna have a lot of time on your hands in like your middle ages, so you could kind of just fill the days learning Logic or Ableton. So, um, obviously I can't predict the future, but at this point in my life it seems plausible that that could happen. What's the best album post first half of 2020 you listened to? So I was thinking about this question and the new Avenade came to mind, the new uh, Jesse Lanza record came to mind, Tell Us by Nicholas Jar as well, but I think uh, the one that I regret not talking about the most is Heart Failure by Common Abago. Um, everything about this just as a piece of art strikes me as so clever. First of all, the synth timbres are just really flashy and neon and ostentatious. There are a lot of really clunky melodies and like broiled electronics. Broiled is the word I'm using there, yes. Um, and this is a dance pop record. Um, it feels like its stylistic origins are very much in genres you're supposed to get up and move to um, that were designed to be that way. But on top of that, um, when it comes to the lyrics on this record, it feels like the lead singer is almost like making fun of himself for putting up with all the shit that this person he was romantically involved with put him through. So in a way, it's like he's sarcastically just dancing the pain away. As a whole, I feel like really this record is just about 
purposeful extravagance and showiness. Um, like you could even say that about his voice, which of course is genuinely really dynamic and visceral. He comes across like he has a background in like soul or R and B. Um, basically I just feel like there are elements of this record that could be seen as, um, ironic, but then there are elements that are actually really intelligent and some that could be seen in either way. Um, and everything is just like in perfect agreement on this thing, which I feel like is a quality that, um, is prevalent in really all of the records that I end up loving. Um, and it's the same way with like all of the genres that it's bringing together. Like there's some hyper pop in here, some funk and soul and, um, of course dance pop, like I said, um, some like 80s electronic styles in there, um, but it's all like perfectly seamless and comes across as really confident and just free of inhibitions. And I love how flamboyant the lead singer's voice is. He sounds totally unafraid to express himself. And this record as a whole just strikes me as really confident and free of inhibitions. And I love that about it. And would definitely recommend it if you haven't heard it, cause it's a blast. Next question is, have you ever met Milo? I've not, unfortunately. Or fortunately, honestly, because if I did, I would probably be so nervous that I would definitely say or do something really stupid and just kind of make a fool of myself and ruin the experience. So maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Um, best music to smash to. Uh, <laughs> whatever's personal between the two of you, I imagine. Like, maybe find records that remind you of each other. Um, but, I mean... This is totally dependent on what type of person you are, what kind of music you listen to anyway, what kind of sex it is, you know, there are a lot of factors that could go into this, so I don't know if it's really my authority to tell you what music to have sex to. Was there ever a particular piece of visual art or artist that has been a profound influence on your personal work? Um, honestly, no. Um... I don't really know how to elaborate here, but my paintings are pretty much just synesthesia and then um, I stare at them until they look right. <laughs> like, I don't know. I guess uh, my college professor, Jane Himes, was a really big influence on like uh, the type of stuff I make now. But no, um, I do find art history interesting, um, but there has never been a single like just one singular artist that I've like, um, I felt my artistic vision be totally changed by, you know? Um, so yeah, maybe at some point in the future that will happen, but for right now I'm, I'm content with how I make stuff. And then, um, have you been to any shows? And if so, what was your favorite? Yeah, I've been to a lot of shows, um, definitely over a hundred. And um, my favorite show I've ever been to is probably the Death Grips concert that I went to in October of 2017. Um, that was an experience, seriously. Like, I don't even think it matters if you listen to Death Grips, if you like Death Grips. Like, a show of theirs is just something else entirely. Um, and... I just remember how it felt afterwards, like on the subway, just riding back alone. Like I just felt so filled with this just empowered feeling and I've never gotten that from a concert before, but it really stuck with me. Um, and yeah. What was your introduction to experimental avant-garde music? For me, it was Bjork. And from there I discovered more left field music like Shushu, for example. Um, I don't remember who the first like experimental artist I ever listened to was. I just remember starting to listen to a bunch of them at once. And I think continuously throughout my life, I've just tried to listen to music that I perceive as kind of weird or unfamiliar to me. Um, and now I'm at the point where nothing's really all that weird at all, in a sense, if you know what I mean. Um, favorite Godspeed You Black Emperor album, I think is gonna be Lift Your Skinny Fists. I do think, to the group's credit, all of their records have something that differentiates them from the rest, but none of them truly just shake me to my core the way this one does. Um, it has this incredibly special aura about it that I'm not entirely sure how to describe. 
it's maybe like knowing for certain that you're actually about to die and having something of like an out of body experience directly before just seeing all the events of your life or everything that's ever meant anything to you just kind of play out in front of you one last time. But I feel more this sense of pure terror in that death rather than any remote sense of contentment. It makes me feel like I'm looking at all of these scenes of hospitals and ambulances and they're just blurring together in my head. At the same time, I could imagine this album taking place in a distinctly religious setting, like in a church or cathedral or at the gates of hell when you know you're being faced with eternal suffering or perdition. And oftentimes when I listen to it, I just feel like I'm in this disturbing religious dream and it's corrupting my soul or my peace. But at the same time, in some way, it does kind of feel like you're just coming alive in the strongest way that you ever have and for the last time ever. It's so much emotion at once, it feels genuinely kind of debilitating. It's like, it feels like my reality is just unstable or trembling as I'm like listening to it. And then once I'm done, I just feel like I have to disconnect from it for like a couple hours to even like do anything else. Assuming I actually immerse myself in it because it's just, it's that much. And to a certain extent, I feel like some of this description could just apply to post rock in general, but I truly especially feel it for this record, so. Yeah. And then this person also asked, um, thoughts on Grouper. I feel like in one sense, I see the appeal to Grouper, like the lo-fi fuzz to what she does. She treats her instruments in pretty tasteful but subtle ways. Uh, her vocals or layers of vocals often feel pretty distant and um, they don't pick up very much momentum, I guess. And it's the same with like the instrumentals. It's like they never get um, lifted off the ground in like a metaphorical sense within the tracks. So it's like you kind of just have to soak in the puffs of instruments that are there. I imagine listening to her feels similar to how you would feel like sitting on the rings of Saturn or something like that. Or I don't know, her stuff just reminds me of like the moisture that would be in like the gases in outer space or the stratosphere or something. I find it difficult to get absorbed in entire albums by her though because I feel like after a track or two they feel pretty played out and I know she is doing something straightforward and subdued intentionally so that her music has a curative or medicine-like quality to it and she's succeeding in that sense but it's hard for me not to just feel like it's a little bit sensorially drab or um, I guess I just can never personally break past my initial, oh, this is nice reaction to it, but um, she can keep making whatever music makes her happy to make. What was the album artist or genre or music that made you realize you were deeply passionate about music? How did it affect you? For me, it was Jimi Hendrix's music. Um, again, I can't personally say that any specific artist or album or anything like that just suddenly enlightened my ass and just made me feel like music was so much more important than I ever gave it credit for in the past or anything like that. Um, I do think that when I started this channel is when I started to become like deeply stupidly passionate about music and I definitely remember how that felt. I think in my later years of high school and early years of college, I just started to realize that the only place that I was ever looking to for artistic inspiration was to music. So I felt like I wanted it to become a more substantial part of my day-to-day -day life and um, have an incentive to learn a lot more about it and listen to a lot of new styles of music and find new ways to feel connected to them and um, I guess have a gateway to talk to a lot of other people who are deeply invested in music as well and when I used to listen to music I feel like I always felt like there were specific qualities of what I was hearing and feeling that I just didn't know how to pinpoint and articulate to anyone else and it genuinely just felt frustrating. So um, through doing this channel, it's pretty much solved that problem. And yeah, I feel like at that point in my life, I was just burning to kind of get it all out of my system. And I'm really glad that I've done this. What are your thoughts on Haru Nimuri's seminal 2018 debut record, Haru Tashura? Get out of here, Josiah! Fucking nerd. Um, 
thoughts on vinyl records and the environmental problems with their production. Um, so I'm not like an expert on environmental issues, but I do think that this is a very like small part of the problem. Like <laughs> we have to look at this way more broadly. There are much greater forces contributing to this problem. Like why don't we focus more on deforestation or factory farming or like the, what is it? Like hundred something companies that are responsible for like 70% of the world's carbon emissions. Um, I mean, human activity like contributing to climate change is a thing but if you really want to go there like there are so many things that we do every day that like contributes to it and we can't just all stop living our lives so um it just seems like not that productive to get into like whether it's technically immoral to like enjoy your vinyl records you know what i mean and also i mean i feel like the effects of digitally streaming music it could be comparable to the effects of like vinyl records. Sorry about the notification noise. Can we buy cool posters or artwork for the background wall? Are you implying that you guys are gonna like buy me shit for like to decorate my room that I'm gonna move out of in like two months? Um, I mean, I'm not giving you my address, so I would have to like open a P.O. box. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm down, but like, damn, I don't know if it's really gonna be worth it like that. I think you've already answered this, but why don't you give a rating in your reviews? I find that after I do an entire review, my numerical score just feels really separate from all that work I've done. Like, I don't know, I just would rather you try to get the most out of whatever art you're consuming instead of focusing on like, what you would give it out of 10 because I feel like that can kind of discourage you from coming back to certain records and getting as much out of them as you can. Also, what are your thoughts on using drugs while listening to music for a different experience? So I'm fairly straight edge. I'm not passionately opposed to drinking or smoking in the right context, but I feel like I wouldn't really mind if I never could again. Um, congrats on 6K. If someone handed you the ox right now, what would you play? Thank you. And um, I feel like I would have to really kind of read the room and consider who I'm with, what's going on around me, um, and hopefully just find something that's equally accessible and interesting. Um, I'd be curious to know if there was a particular album that has made you feel like you could empathize with the artist's situation or emotions, even though you may not have had the exact same experience as them. Um, I really, really like this question. I love the idea of art just pulling me into the artist's world, even if I have no kind of like personal link to it, it's not relevant to me, whatever. Um, I feel like that might be the mark of a truly great artist to me, is their ability to kind of do that. And I feel like a really good example is Atrocity Exhibition. Again, I have no like real experience with drug abuse or anything like that, but when I listen to that album, I truly feel like I am Danny Brown and my life is just crumbling around me and yeah. Why do you hate the Strokes? <laughs> um, Listen, so I wouldn't want to sit here and deny the influence of a band like The Strokes on indie rock as a whole. That's fine. You guys have that point. Cool. But um, for whatever reason, like the side of my brain that I've manipulated to just immediately pick up on emotion in music and almost even exaggerate the emotion that I sense in music is just like completely resistant to the strokes. Something about the strokes' music just strikes me as so exceptionally dry on like an automatic intuitive level. So it's like hard for me to break past that. But once I do, I feel like it just becomes evident that the most that they really have to offer is a catchy tune, some solid musicianship, which I feel like you could find in just about any other band. And I feel like Julian Casablancas's tone of voice is so just annoyingly unbothered and too cool for you. Much of the time I find their songwriting to be quite dull. If they have a good idea, they portray it in a way that's just so plain, it makes me uninterested in what they're saying, or it's just like overly edgy middle school journal vibes. Um, on the album Is This It, 
a lot of people say the appeal is like the lo-fi quality to the instrumentals and the distortion on Julian's voice, but like, I'm just over that like one to five minutes in. And in general, I feel like anytime I've ever tried to dig more deeply into their stuff, it's just come across as strikingly one dimensional in a way that I don't find a lot of music to be. Um, they are talented musicians, but quite frankly, I don't care when I can't describe their music in a way that's even remotely interesting or evocative. And this person also asked, what's your opinion on otters? Um, yeah, they're cool. I mean, <laughs> you know, they can keep, like, doing their thing over in their corner, um, and I will keep probably not noticing either way. So yeah, but I mean, I hope they're all well. <laughs> I hope all the otters are well. Have you listened to Lord? And if so, what do you think of her? I have, and I really like her. I think her voice is really the sole quality about her that makes her stand out in the greater landscape of pop. It is just such a divine, deep vocal and has the power to just make any track, even in her most low-key deliveries. I do think her songwriting is pretty vivid and visceral most of the time. I'm not going to say she's always making the most evocative decision possible, but... I think her voice and the way her voice hits her production specifically does have the power to make up for that, like in a track like Ribs, but in a track like Buzz Cut Season or Glory and Gore, um, I think it's really good. I do prefer pure heroin to melodrama. I find that it's a lot more seamlessly constructed and just flows better track to track. And the production is quite minimal, but a lot of the time it's just enough to enjoy tracks or to get even more lost in her, her voice, what she's saying, basically all of her strengths. Melodrama's production I can find to be a little bit distracting or ineffective in certain moments, like in the second half of Hard Feelings Loveless or in the way Sober 2 develops. Um, on a lot of the tracks that I almost love on that album, there's just a subtle aspect to the way it's constructed that feels a little bit off-putting or out of place and it's really frustrating. Like, I feel like the only thing that melodrama would theoretically have over pure heroin is just how lush and bright and daring it is, but I don't really see those things in themselves as strengths when a lot of what it's doing is falling a little flat. But I do want to add that generally it just gives me a rush of excitement or almost like chills to see female artists so young that are by default going to be seen as kind of emotionally inexperienced or unprepared for the music industry shit, killing it right off the bat, making things that are a lot smarter than what any of those old fucks saying that stuff could make. Um, and still communicating that rush of youth along with it. Like, Lord talks a lot about partying and love and chasing our dreams, and even though these things kind of border on cliches, it's like they're smart uses of those cliches, if that makes sense. And I feel like all of it just really comes with this enchanting, intoxicating darkness. All right, I think that's gonna be it for this Q&A. Thank you guys so much for sitting down and watching whatever amount of it you did. I really appreciate you continuing to keep up with me even though I'm so inconsistent on this platform. Um, I hope you have a great day. Maybe hear the new Black Midi for me if you haven't already and I'll see you later.